Very excited today to be working on Kotlin, a language I've never used in production and I'm vaguely familiar with. Um, born on the JVM, but now also running on different virtual machines. So let's get some information on Kotlin and let's dive into it. So Kotlin was designed and developed by JetBrains, the company behind IntelliJ. We're talking about a company that became very famous by producing amazing IDE experiences. Uh, it is a language that runs on the JVM, which can target version 6 or higher, including the Android platform. JetBrain wanted to use a statically typed language which can remove Java boilerplate code, provide modern functional paradigms, and had seamless two-way Java interoperability with their existing code base. What this means is that the language was developed to cut on the amount of code needed to actually achieve uh, or satisfy some requirements, but at the same time without having to start in from scratch. And so they wanted a language that is interoperable with all the code they had written in Java, which makes a lot of sense. Sounds like a sensible thing to do if you are a Java shop. The JVM already had alternate uh, languages like Groovy and Scala, but neither fit the bill with their desired criteria, so they built Kotlin. Sounds a bit extreme to build a language, but at the same time, if you're big enough and your engineers are eager enough, then there's always space for a new language. Kotlin syntax is similar to Scala and Swift, but pulls in the best of, bre of breed features uh, from other languages such as C Sharp and Groovy. Kotlin took a pragmatic approach at features included in the language by only providing functionality that has been proven to be useful for developers. And I guess it's a good thing that that language was developing internally because then the same engineers that develop the language are also using the language and so you have this interesting relationship between the people developing the language and users. Um, and that probably leads to a language that tries to cut on things that are not needed mostly day to day. Uh, with this decision they implemented a subset of features of Scala with the intent that it will provide more maintainable code with an easier learning curve for developers looking for a better Java. And this, this has long been a, a piece of criticism around, around Scala, which I think, I think has been mainly addressed through the move to Scala 3, which is the fact that the language is quite vast and the learning curve is a bit steep. But again, I think yeah, what I found really, really impressive about Scala is how Scala 3 was not just a new iteration, but a very significant effort to make the language much, much sim simpler, both from a, from a language design point of view, but especially looking at the usability. And so I'm sure that having Kotlin in the, in the ring definitely kind of helped uh, Scala improve and, and take a, an even better direction than it would have otherwise. Okay, the hello world looks simple enough. And uh, we can just go there and get started opening the hello world now with some nice syntax highlighting. Looking at the tests as well, tests are only checking for uh, equality of the string. So we can go and try and grill test again. Okay, and this doesn't work, right? Failed, okay. And then we can do hello world and then think about what comes next. Okay, now we the build was successful, which is a great sign. It means that we seem to have a nice environment now to code Kotlin locally. Uh, and uh, so setting up the next few exercises exorcism exercises should be much much easier i'll do this i'll just uh, go to the help md and look at the line we need to use to to run to actually submit and try this out and then it says your solution has been, has been submitted successfully so now we can go back to the website and i can see that the exercise has been submitted. 
I, I know because I can see that it says mark as complete. Uh, and so I can just say, yeah, go for it. And show me more exercises. So that's it. I know a bit underwhelming, but the first exercise is done. What we'll do is we'll pick an exercise uh, to go after the hello world. And we can definitely start with twofer, which is uh, an exercise we've tried in other languages already. So that's going to help a bit. And the idea here is we have, um, we're going to return a string. We need a function that returns a string where we can either just say one for you and one for me, or if a name is provided to the function, then we return one for name and then one for me. So that should be easy enough. I'm going to switch to uh, VS Code. Uh, the first thing we need to do is we need to actually check out the exorcism uh, exercise. So I'll open the terminal here, which you can see down here, and then I'll copy paste the exorcism command to download the second exercise. That should go straight into the exorcism folder. Uh, now we have our nice source file under main. We need, we need to implement our twofer function and we have a set of tests. Uh, this is actually nice that we checked out the project so that we can actually see, um, look at the tests and see what they are um, about and also uh, try and understand what a test framework might or library might feel like in that language. So let me just check my camera again. So maybe I need to make this window a bit smaller so that I don't lose details. Yeah, let's do this. And then you should be able to see and not lose any detail when I'm typing. So we have a set of tests here. And I think the first thing we need, the first thing we need to do is, uh, so we know that we want to produce a string like this one. I'm copy pasting that from the, from the test. So the first step would be to just say, okay, we're going to say one for you, one for me. A couple of things we want to check is the return statement even needed. And, um, can we actually provide default argument to the function? So I have to switch back to the browser to go and check these two things. Okay. So I'll do Kotlin default parameters. Um, it says you can provide default values for parameters in function definitions, and this is how you do it. So you do name of the parameter, then the type, and then equal the default value. So that's the first thing we, we want to know. And the second one is return mandatory. Uh, make return optional. So this seems to be a Kotlin discussion, meaning we must use the return uh, keyword. Although it says the return keyword already is optional for functions in Kotlin. There's a star there. I don't know what the star is. So it seems we might just be able to um, enjoy a returnless um, function definition. Let me try that out. I'll say this equals uh, you. And then we'll also need the string interpolation. I'm just going for uh, what I think it might be, but maybe let's go and check. Back to the browser and look for Kotlin string interpolation, very popular entry. And let's see how this works. We're gonna reject cookies. Okay, it seems like we were on a good path. So dollar sign seems to be the one. Uh, and that's, there's also a breakdown of how that gets interpreted at the virtual machine level, which is interesting. Uh, okay, so going back to the editor, if I can just do this and try the code. Uh, you probably remember we did Gradle W test. We need to make uh, Gradle W executable. So we'll do A plus X and try again. 
we might have to download some stuff. Let's see. Mm, we failed in ways. Let's see. Compilation of error. Um, dash dash info maybe. A lot more information. Mm, let's try not upset the compiler. I've added the return statement. Better. So <laughs> good to know. We had to add the return statement and we seem to be passing the tests. Now, something I've noticed is that some of the tests are marked as, marked as ignore. We probably want to remove that. I can do that quickly by selecting one ignore, then selecting all the other instances and deleting. And if I save and run this again, we're running a few more tests uh, and it seems that we've built with success. We can try out, right? So I, I can try and, and remove a character on the test and see if a test fails. And if it does, what's going to be printed? Okay, we are failing something. And uh, if I try and scroll up, yeah, we can see a, a, a failure message. Expected one four, but actually got this other thing. And the output is actually pretty useful because it tells me how the two strings differed between each other. We can also probably avoid the dash dash info now that we figured out that we were not compiling the code properly and restore the test as it was run a test again so this looks like we got the first exercise done past the hello world so we can now exorcism uh, submit here's the line i'm looking for and then we should be able to move on to the next exercise we seem to be okay with this and i can just mark this as complete and move on to the next exercise. Um, okay, so one exercise done. Let's move on to something new. Given a moment, determine the moment that would be after a gigasecond has, had, has passed. Maybe, what else? Calculate the humming difference between two DNA strands. Okay, this sounds like fun. String, uh, string manipulation, uh, let's see. Calculate the humming distance between two DNA strands. We will skip the biology lesson and just go straight into, we read DNA using the letters C, A, G, and T. Two strands might look like this. Okay, strand one, strand two. They have seven differences and therefore the humming distance between the two is seven, meaning in first position we have a G for one and a C for the other one, that's a distance of one. Second position, A on both, so that's a zero. Third position, a G and a T, that's a difference, so it counts as an extra one, and so on. And the, dis the humming distance between these two strings will just be the number of characters in the same position that differ um, from one another. Okay, so knowing that, we'll probably want to do something like, I don't know, zipping the strings and then um, uh, and then compare each each item. So let's see. Meanwhile, let me just look at chat for a second. It's going well with Kotlin. We had to uh, install some dependencies um, on on the on the computer. Unfortunately, Exorcism doesn't seem to offer a, an online editor, so it took a bit more setup than usual. But other than that, I think we're now on a good on a good path. Uh, to actually succeed. So I just copied the download command to start with this new exercise. And as we did before, we can just say exorcism download. So here we are. And if we, again, open a terminal, try and run the tests, but also look at the code. So for example, comparing two empty strings should return zero, comparing uh, two strings with a single letter, which are identical, the distance should be one. And then the other base example is one where we have two one letter strings and they differ. So distance is gonna be one, then two identical strings and so on and so forth. Yeah. 
Um, also interesting, uh, and this is a, maybe a, a bonus, but when one string is longer than the other, the expectation looking at the test, so the specification here is asking us to, well, reading test as a specification, which is a good idea if these are great tests, um, we want to throw an exception when one string is longer than the other, okay? Same, no matter in which order, right? So we seem to have a pretty precise uh, idea of how we need to operate here, I think. And I think that idea of um, zipping the strings and then reducing on the strings, on, on the zip string and, and counting, keeping account of how many characters are different is, is a, as a viable one. So what I'll do in order to execute on that idea, I would like to check out Kotlin's documentation uh, to check whether we have a zip function available. Uh, for example, here it says, look, you might have dot zip and then another list, and then you obtain a list of pairs. Okay, now a pair is actually something that I'm not too familiar with. It's probably going to be a tuple of size two, but it would be interesting to know how you access elements. Okay, there's a first and a second, which are probably just accessible with a dot second dot first, and we can turn that into a list too. Okay, this is all good to know. So what I suggest is we go back to the code and do something like, so we have the left strand and we want to turn this into a list. I'm going to guess that a split function exists. Um, let me also say return to or whatever. Okay. Um, and try and do great old W test. And here we are. We get a compilation error. It says mm, there's an overload resolution ambiguity, meaning the way I've uh, called the split function is not good enough for um, for Kotlin's compiler to understand which version of the split function I'm calling or method I'm calling. So I'm gonna add a delimiter which is a string and I'm just going to put in an empty string and let's see let's see where this gets us uh, and actually maybe we can print a len I think this is a thing in Kotlin so let's see we're now compiling and we're running our tests some of them are skipped and an assertion is um, uh, failed but we should also see something right and we have some interesting, useful information from the compiler saying, hey, right strand is never used, so good to know. Uh, none expected. Okay, we'll skip that one. And I can't see what we wanted to see. So I don't see any output. Am I missing it? Maybe I can run with debug. Because I don't want to go in sort of blind and not know if we're on the right track. So what if I do dash dash debug? Will we see the string that we wanted to print? Wow, this is a lot of output. Maybe info is a bit more manageable. Okay, there's a bunch of tests that are skipped. Uh, some useful information there you go I think oh yeah this is the, the the standard output I think so this is what we're printing an empty list is, is it the right thing yes I think it is the right thing is it an empty list probably okay so let's try this right so if we do split the left strand do the same thing with and then and then zip it with the second, with the right strand, which we also split on empty space. And then what do we want to do? 
well let's let's print this for the time being so i'm saving also i'm also removing the ignore on some of the tests to make this a bit more to make the output a bit more interesting so rather than ignore i'll run these as well and also on this test just to get a bit of a better sense for how far we are in the decomposition of the task so for example here we're printing empty and empty character and then gt and then empty empty okay our test run in the order I don't know if it, I, it might be that the test runner runs test in random orders or maybe the output is coming out a bit mangled in any case you can see that we are very close to where we need to be right I'm noticing that we have this starting empty tuple which I don't really understand and maybe if we look at the documentation for um, for for split there's maybe something that we can learn also how do you look at the documentation uh, there doesn't seem to be seem, there doesn't seem to be an extension well it doesn't look like the extension is enabling us to look at the documentation for the functions but that's okay so okay let's say we're happy and we want to just proceed here and I'll, 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 I wanted to notice some th something else looking at empty strands that's okay and looking at uh, two identical strings that's fine and then two that are different okay okay so the suggestion is one now that we have these left and right strands and we split them and we zip them together what we can then do is we can reduce and say look you're gonna have some sort of count of well the basically the measure of the humming distance and the current tuple let's call it left and right characters and then what we want to do is I guess I'm just coming up with syntax here right this is what I'd like to do what I'd like to do is I'd like to say return count plus one or plus zero depending on whether L and R are equal so if L equals R then return one otherwise return zero and increment the count depending right and I also want to start with a count of zero and again we need to go and check out the documentation for count so let's do that back to the browser and look for the reduce function or method I should say mm, reduce we have accumulator and then the value coming from the array and is there a signature that allows me to define an initial value in it an initial value accumulated is first element so this looks like let's see reduce and then we have Uh, hmm. uh, just trying it like checking out if I can pass an initial value here Count. yeah this is not helping Let's see if we can see some examples. Always uh, interesting to notice whether you get sent to the official documentation straight away. Radius X vars. Okay, so maybe I can't. So this is the thing we are reducing on. Or is it? No, no, no. These are the two parameters. So accumulator and then the other one. Yeah. This doesn't look right anyway. So Y bars. Yeah. Uh 
not a great example. Can we pass an initial value? Example three. Oh, I saw a reduced right, which maybe no. We have this, this, nothing new. Okay, no. Okay, let's be more explicit. Initial value. Uh, okay, maybe Stack Overflow will support this. Fold allows an initial value. Does reduce? Reduce doesn't seem to. Okay, so let's go for fold. Give it an initial value. And then we seem to be on the right track with the accumulator and then the element, which in our case is a pair. And we're going to try and do a destructuring assignment sort of thing, uh, where we just try and pattern match with L and R. So with, with, the, with the tuple here, I don't know if that works, but we can try. I also noticed that rather than plain parentheses, we need to use braces here. Okay. And the initial value of the fold is going to be a nice zero. What comes out of this is the count or again, um, distance. Let's call it dist. And do we need to use a var to initialize this thing? Maybe, maybe there's better ways. We can also make this a bit more readable. We're zipping and then folding and then counting. There you go. This is it. Decent. Let's see if this is actually a thing. Build failed with exception. Okay. Uh, I can probably, and there's some ambiguity around what? Uh, let me just remove the info bit. and focus on the compilation error. Okay, it says expecting parenthesis line seven. Okay, let's let's try and let's say this is, a, we call this element and then we do L first and then L second, which is how we access elements in a pair, apparently in Kotlin. Let's try again, let's see if we got any closer. Line 762, maybe the ternary operator is not a thing yet, which is fine, that's okay. Uh, so we would do, let's just go back to the browser for a moment. Kotlin ternary operator. Hello, please add ternary operator. And I guess the answer is no, we're not gonna do that. So we can just use if else or do it on a single line. Uh, seems easy enough. Let's not be too precious about this. So if el first equals el second, and actually here we have to say zero, otherwise one, right? So else. Then is there no just just the maybe the curly brackets are not mandatory but for the sake of just getting over with this getting this over with let's just do this okay uh, forty three expecting a condition in parentheses okay that's okay you never know. Okay, uh, what's the matter here? Line six, type mismatched, right? Infer type is int, but this was expected. Mm. Do I maybe not need the parentheses here? And this is confusing 
the compiler because I've noticed that. Oh, oh gosh, this is working. Amazing. Do we want to also check if the structuring assignment or like call it pattern matching or works? Let's try. So this would be L and write. Let's see if this is a thing. It is. Okay, brilliant. So this is actually quite handy, right? Uh, now, if we enable all the tests, what I know is that we're going to fail some. Save, run the tests. We're failing a few. Uh, we can look at which ones. We're failing disallowed, second, uh, second strand longer, same for the first one. And also we're failing another one, right? Failed. The output is not super readable here, but I guess it's hard to work around the JVM's way of showing you what failed. It's just two tests that failed. Uh, where do I, where can I read that? Yeah, seven tests completed, two failed. Okay, so the only thing missing here is this sort of bonus uh, exercise of saying look if left strand size is not equal to right hand uh, right strand size and again making methods up we'll see if they actually exist and uh, then throw an exception okay so if mm, this whatever then and then we can use remember to put this in parentheses then and then I don't know if this is a raise or something but illegal argument exception raise new illegal argument exception let's go and have a quick look at how exceptions work in Kotlin you can see that we're back in uh, Java virtual machine land because we're now talking about exception for the for the first time in in a few streams right um, okay Kotlin raise exception throw okay and then the constructor is actually nice we don't need the new keyword we can just do this so going back here we can do throw illegal argument exception and let's see if we need to pass any argument to this Oh, there's also a message. Oh no, there's a message expected. Uh, fine, <laughs> that says, look, it's the left one that is, okay, it's the same, it's the same for both, okay. So this is the error message. Let's see if we're not passing all the tests. We are not. Build failed. Okay, why? What, we have some compilation errors. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Info. Tell me why. Size doesn't exist. Okay. Um, again, interesting that I had to go info to actually figure out what was wrong with this, right? And is this failing? A compilation time, yeah, I guess. So size is not a thing. Is len a thing on strings? Why not? It is success, great success. And so if we now look at the help, I'll, I'll go over what we just did in a moment. So submit. We're submitting first. And then we can reflect on the code we wrote. So first of all, we are exiting with, with an exception if um, the two strands are not the same size, which makes sense. Um, if they are of the same size, what we do is we split the string into a string into a, an array of characters, and then we zip it together with the other list coming from the other strand, and then we fold on the zipped array 
and count starting from zero and increment the count anytime the two zipped values are different from one another. And what this leads to is the humming distance in the end. So this was fun, really like this. We are two exercises in. I suggest we do this. We go back to um, exorcism for a moment, check that the exercise was submitted properly. It was, confirm this. Look at some more exercises, pick one. Uh, let's say, ooh, given a word, compute the scramble, okay, the score for that word, or maybe this gigasecond, which is recommended, so it should be good. Given a moment, determine the moment that would be after a gigasecond has passed. A gigasecond is 10 to the power of nine seconds. Okay, is this just about incrementing um, something? Let's check it out and then take a break, okay? So let's look at the at the code and at the test for a start, okay? It says date only specification of time. We create a gigasecond object, I guess, because this seems looks like a constructor. Start from a local date of Okay, which comes from Java time. And then we do gigasecond date. Oh, okay. I think I understand what's going on here. So when we build a gigasecond object, what we're doing is we're taking a, a date and we're just incrementing that by that gigasecond thing. And that's going to return, so gigasecond date is that return, then returning the initial date given in the constructor plus that 10 to the power of nine seconds, okay? Intriguing. It's like, what? Um, 77? Three years to 1980, then 29 years, 33, th sorry, 32 years. Yeah, it seems to be 32 years um, and a few days, right? So I guess, okay, this should be straightforward enough, but it's a great opportunity to look at classes in uh, Kotlin. And again, I think we've not looked at uh, classes in any in any other language so far on Exorcism. So this is going to be interesting. Implement proper constructor. We can only do this by... Like, is it enough to just implement the... I guess, I guess we need to implement a constructor, yeah? It's not as simple as that. So let's go back to browser and look at Kotlin class constructor mm -hmm. okay so constructor and then the thing oh, how does this work class name huh okay so I think from this, right, it looks like we can just define a constructor by letting mm, just just by um, putting the, the parameters to build the object straight into the class signature. And then we seem to be able to use those parameters within the body of the of the class definition uh, to define fields and functions, I guess. We're looking at fields in particular and these init blocks, which seem terrifying um, 
in terms of ergonomics, but I guess maybe they're a thing in, in Kotlin. Mm -hmm. What about, mm -hmm. and we're, we're, we're using val, okay? So when we are not planning on mutating the value of a field, we can use val rather than var. That's good to know as well. And then we get into annotations, which we don't, don't need to get to. And then for secondary constructors, we would be using the constructor keyword, which is also a thing. Okay, I think we have enough information. Let's go back to our code. And so what we know is that we're going to be passing, and again, we can just learn from this. This is a, we will need a local date. Okay, and probably a local date time too. So I'm just going to import this. Okay, local date was already there. I'm importing a local date time as well. Although that might be, yeah. This might be returning a local date time anyway. So, so maybe we don't need this, but who knows? And then the other thing is, um, we call this initial date, okay? Initial date of type It's a, we, we don't even need to make this accessible. We can say this is a local date time and we'll know straight away if we're doing this right or not. Okay. And then the other thing we need to do is we need to define a val, val here. And you remembered um, just looking back at the at the readme, the, the request, this is, a, this is the thing that we are asked to add to the initial date, to the date given, right? And we mentioned this is around 33 years. And so the idea would be to do what? Maybe just, you know, we can turn this into days just because it's maybe a bit more handy. And because um, otherwise, 10 to the power of nine, or maybe we can just increment giga seconds. Do this is a val giga second val, and we can do take the initial date provided by the user, and then increment by whatever, however many seconds. Uh, so what we want to check is, we want to check a couple of things. One, in Java date time, or is it, was it um, local date time? Local date time, which I don't think makes a big difference, but so if we do Java local date time, add seconds plus seconds oh we just need to make sure that plus seconds is happy to take an a, a, a 10 digit uh integer let's see so plus seconds or is this this is not a thing, okay, or do we? Yeah, it seems to be a thing. Uh, but what's the signature of that? Wouldn't it be great to just go to the official documentation? Plus seconds. Because I want to know what the, oh, oh, it takes long. Okay, so that should be on okay, right? We we can try, uh, I think maybe maybe that's, that's just fine. So plus seconds is the method we're looking for. Plus seconds, gigaseconds. Yeah. 
we're not yeah let's see how far off. this is probably not going to compile but fine whatever we need to start somewhere um, yeah uh, let me just try and, and run this without the info which sometimes is a bit confusing uh, You second seven expecting an element okay uh, let me just look at exponentiation in Kotlin Kotlin exponent is that a thing no power raised to the power of something pow to okay so we do 10 how yeah is this gonna be okay and is there a definition for long as well raised to power what to double okay open to double yeah i don't know what the double exclamation mark is about but fine okay we can just go for pow uh, i'll do pow nine Let's see. Unresolved pow. Let me just make this a bit bigger so we can iterate a bit quicker. So what's the matter? Unresolved reference to pow. Do I need to make this a double um, or a long? Can I just make this a long? Expecting an element or just ten L or capital L. Um, L yes, use capital L rather than L. Maybe we're getting closer. Maybe not. Let's see. It doesn't know what this is, okay. What if we do double pow to long? Do we have a from int or something? Because double doesn't seem to exposes a constructor um, no no from it okay fine uh, let's just look at more docs Kotlin init double one double just just like that okay so maybe if we just do but then we did try 10.0 and it didn't like the power thing what was the story there Kotlin pow under math do we need to import Kotlin math maybe we do Let's give it a go. Let's see. Killed by double, not by double. Okay. Import Kotlin point math. Or was it capital math? No, I think. I think we should be good.
packages cannot be imported so what like pow okay and then it, okay we're getting there and then too long does it want the parenthesis maybe almost okay so where are we type mismatch inferred local date time okay we can just say this is a local date yeah or where so wait here it says inferred type is local date but local date time was expected okay so this is returning a local date I'm actually expecting a local date time I should just change my expectation and say no I'm happy with local date and then plus seconds unresolved reference plus seconds hmm it doesn't know what it is is that because local date doesn't have uh, uh, okay so java local date add se oh okay because uh, local date time does have seconds but local date maybe doesn't so can i go local date to local date time which is probably everyone's problem uh, we have local date yeah we can do this at start of day <laughs> well okay let's give this a go and see how it goes so if we do at start of day first and then run this We are back to this type mismatch inferred. Gigasecond local date time. Does it actually? Oh, I see. There seem to be two constructors here that can be used, maybe. One accepts a local date time, the other one accepts a local date. Date only specific area. Okay. okay, so. Do we need to go and say, look, I'll define an explicit constructor for initial date, local date, and one for initial date, local date time? Is that the way this should work? Maybe. Uh, and depending right what do we do because this is a bit more painful so it's fine that we have this val this constant gigasecond here i think that's okay and then date will be okay let's do let's see if we can avoid duplication later but for now let's be happy with this so if it is a local date time we don't need to go at start of day we can just add the seconds if it is not then we need to convert it and then go okay let me just add one comment on top of this uh this should be it at least mm, i wonder how so I do, like do we need to I guess we need to declare date somewhere and maybe we do it outside like here and we say this is a local local date time and then here we don't declare the variable anymore we just assign it again making this up a bit from you know memories of how Java works um, 
Cool, we seem to be passing some tests. Do we pass all the tests? Uh, I'm gonna remove the ignore here and try and run this again. Brilliant, so we're passing all the tests. Going back to the code for a moment. Uh, can we invoke one constructor from the other? There's mixed feelings about this in general, in the community, I guess, but I think in this case, it would be, it would make sense that we call, we, we convert. So we would do a, something like constructor initial date at start of day. So reuse the constructor at the top. Is that even a thing? Or maybe just, uh, just, let's look this up because I think this is interesting and and it, it's good to see how the language approaches this so if we do Kotlin call constructor from another constructor so this okay this should be the answer okay let's see like literally this or not uh, property must be initialized or be abstract do we want it to be no we, uh, we're fine hmm uh, this is a, an interesting conundrum let's not waste too much time on this but how does this work? So it goes like, uh, oh, okay. Um, or we could use a primary constructor. Hmm. Okay. I mean, I say okay, but I don't have this super clear. Maybe we call super super on the same argument. It's a bit awkward, but because this is what I had in mind, something like this, and maybe it's just a matter of syntax. Like I don't open the block; I just go straight for this. Or call to this let's try that so that would look like colon something like this yes this is much nicer yeah so let me just save again run the test and then submit Brilliant. Let's go back to Exorcism, refresh this page, mark as complete, move on. Let's count the exercises we went through. We did four, including other word, so we need another couple of exercises to, to own the language, so to speak, according to the 12 in 23 um, challenge we are going through. Shall I go for, so we know that different source squares should be super easy uh, and we can actually recover we can actually do a one-to-one -one comparison with the uh, Julia solution here so what I'll do is I'll go back to the editor check out the exercise open the folder and I'll give you a reminder of what this is about and then we can just go to the Julia solution and then compare them one one for one Okay, so the idea here is to compute the difference between the sum of squares of the first n natural numbers and the square of the sum of the first n natural numbers. Um, and in this case, we are using a class to do this, meaning we will store the number n that we're looking for, I guess, 
and then we will call sum of squares on that object which is a bit seems like a bit of an over overkill and a very object oriented heavy approach uh, but you know let's just embrace it I'm going back to the Julia track which we tackled yesterday and I'm going to look at the difference of squares and I'll open open that code and it was very useful it's very useful to look at, to look at this because I can see um, the the closed formulas for for these two computations right so I'm gonna go back here I'll paste them straight away this was the first one and this is the second one I can remove everything else okay um, meaning okay if we say we have a field called n then the sum of squares is um, sum of squares maybe I need to swap them square of sum yeah I need to swap the order so this one you take the square of the sum so you sum the first n uh, natural numbers and then you take the power of two whereas the other one is this which is you take the sum of the first n squares and there's a closed formula for this which is this one what we want to do is we want to implement a proper constructor which is just going to say n give me n which is an integer just assuming integers are a thing in Kotlin maybe they are not maybe just int is it just int who knows and then the this was an integer division let's assume that integer division is done differently here we can actually look it up and then exponentiation might also be different uh, again I'm making up this word probably but you know raising to the power of two that's what I meant uh, so let's just check the documentation for a moment we'll do two things one uh, I'll keep this open Kotlin uh, integer division Oh, that's probably what we get straight away we take two ints and we do one divided by the other we get the integer division okay and the other one we wanted to look was raising to the power of something um, we saw that for double numbers but what about integer power do we have to convert we've seen this before Kotlin does not have an exponent operator. Okay, there is my pow. Kotlin also have functions. Should you need to use exponents with ints or longs, you just convert to double and then back into int later. Okay, we can do that. Fine by me. So this becomes just the regular division, and this goes into pow. So this goes dot pow two and then probably two int I'm assuming and then the difference becomes trivial, right? Because it's just square of sum minus sum of squares. And looking at the tests, we always have integers here, so we should be fine. Let's see how far off the mark we are. Again, making gradle w executable and then running the tests. Failing in many different ways. Let's see where exactly. Oh yeah, this was the integer division. This goes into a regular slash. Maybe that was it. It was also line four. It was complaining about line four as well. Oh, the two n. Now, 
interestingly, 2n works in Julia because Julia is so so much targeting mathematics that 2n can be written as an expression and it turns into 2 times n. But of course, I have to be a bit more explicit with um, Kotlin. What else is missing here? Line un unable to resolve n, so we want to mark these as val, I think. This is what we would do in uh, in Scala, for example. Otherwise, the compiler doesn't know that that's a field of the class. What else? Oh, and unable to resolve pow, but we don't have a problem there. We know we need to import Kotlin map pow. One after the other seem to be going to fix everything. So we need to go, in order to be able to call pow, we need to go to double and then back to int. That was also recommended in the um, Stack Overflow page we visited. What else? Uh, for too many arguments for public final fun. Too many arguments. Right, yes. Because, yeah. Again, this is um, object oriented to a level of discomfort, but yeah, fine. Um, we just call the square of sum and sum of squares, and then n is actually a field in the in the class uh, definition. Yeah. Cool. Line fourteen. Unresolved reference. None of the following candidates is applicable because of receiver type mismatch. Right. Is because one of these might be. A big int, right? Maybe because of these multiplications. This is probably an in int, right? I would expect these two, but what's the matter? Oh, a return statement is required for us, of course. Yes, we know. One return statement, two return statements, and then we go. And then we're back to the issue of look. The value of the type parameter t should be mentioned in input types. No, I don't think we have any. Square test 51. What's the matter? Does this only happen with difference? Probably, yeah. Maybe we can be explicit about the return type. And then and then of course return statement. Wow, we were really left the very anemic bit of code, right? Okay, so let me delete this and go back to tests. We seem to be passing the tests that are enabled. I'm gonna remove ignore from here, try and run the tests again. We seem to be passing all the tests so we didn't have to worry about um, getting into the into big decimal or anything like that uh, or big int uh, which is good and I think we can just be happy with this and submit the exercise uh, on the help page right so we're good and I'm gonna go back to the browser refresh this page mark as complete and go back to the exercise page so okay we've done five including the hello word can we get one which is a bit 
easy. Um, this probably requires dictionaries. Given a decimal number, convert it to the appropriate sequence of events for a secret handshake. Let's look at this one quickly. This might be a bit easier. And maybe it only requires conditionals. So given a decimal number, convert it to the appropriate sequence of events for a secret handshake. Right. Okay. For example, what given the input three, the function would return wink double blink because three is one one in binary. So we would get a number in uh, the uh, in base ten. We'd have to convert it into base two, and then and then what? Wink and then double and then read the number from right to left nineteen would return this because I would expect a wink, a double blink, and then not this, not this, and then a reverse, so a double wink and then a and then a wink, yeah. Okay, it's not too hard. How do we go from how do we convert from uh, well we can actually just divide by two a number of times. I was thinking how do we convert the int into a base two representation? Maybe there's a shortcut to that. Um, int to base two and then we can just make it a matter of or maybe we just shift we can just use the shift operator maybe um, to binary string where a is an int this method is from java okay and otherwise you do use to string two which is what you would do in ruby for example and then what and then you just go character by character but I wonder if we can just do left, well, shift, uh, shift, right or left. Um, so we should have some operators basic types on numbers and shift s h l bits sign shift left okay uh, let's see what's easier and sign shift right yes Bitwise inversion, or we could do an XOR, XOR on, yeah, we can probably do XOR, right? Or an end, actually. We could do an end between the secret codes and the integer we have, and then look at uh, what stays on, basically. So if we get through, then if we if we end if we do a, a bitwise end between the integer we have and um, the secret code, if the result is true, then that secret code is part of the handshake. Okay, let's do that. Let's try that. This sounds exciting. We're gonna, we're gonna copy the uh, usual string. Go back to. VS Code, check out the project, open the folder, secret handshake, as usual, make Gradle executable, then 
run the test, see that they fail, and that's fine, and look at the code. So source main, ooh, what signal? Oh, we have an enum as well. Mm. I don't know if I'm gonna go through the trouble of defining the enum, but maybe we should, Maybe because maybe we can associate an integer to each one of these. I'm gonna go back to the document, to the um, readme for a moment and just remind us that we have this. One second. Okay, copy, paste, make this all commented out. Can we do. Okay, this is the time where we learn something about enums in Kotlin. So if I do. Yeah, value of enum classes in Kotlin. Ooh, wow. This is exactly what we want. This is great. So we do val RGB. So are we explicit about that? I guess we are. This is awesome. So we can just take this as inspiration. Go back to this and basically what we want is something similar to this color thing where we do a signal call it int like val int of type int and then we associate a value to each one so this is one and the double wink is 10 which is not actually 10 right we're talking about we need to think base 2 uh, so this is actually one, but this is um, the double wink is two to the power of uh, two, yeah. So it's actually a four. And if you want, we can actually use the look. We can actually use the binary notation, right? We can do zero b one. Is it is that what it is, or is it yeah? And then 0b10 so we don't even have to think and do the conversion in our mind although it would be just 2 4 8 and then 16 and then 32 but we don't care we don't want to do that just want to save any mental energy and then there's the reverse right and the reverse at this point is not even represented but I think it could be I think it could be, because why not? Okay. So we kill this. Again, I'm assuming this is how you define binary numbers. Maybe we can check. Uh, Kotlin binary. Let's see. I'm just gonna go by what you do with um, Java, I think. So if I do this, let's put it for zero x. So zero x would be hexadecimal binaries with a b. Okay. Do I need to put in all the zeros as well? Maybe not. I don't think I do. We can just try this out and see how it goes. Okay, this is how far I got. So we define an, em an enum with uh, elements having a binary representation, which we uh, export as an integer. And then in the handshake calculator, we'll just, we're just doing um, a list of uh, whatever this is and we put in the signal if the end operator returns true the bitwise operator uh, or basically we're basically saying is this equal to the wink right 
So this is what we're doing actually. Just trying to make like figure it out myself. So I think what we're doing is we're doing a bitwise end and then we're checking for equality to the actual thing. And this is probably a better way of doing this, but for the sake of trying this out. Uh, then this is a list of signal wing for the time being yeah this should compile at least and i tend to forget about the return statement that's the habit okay we're finally building successfully and i want to check whether we are printing what i think we should print and so dash dash info to actually see the debugging lines Going up, up, up. What are we printing? Configure and project. Okay, and then please give me something. We're not running any tests. Why? Are we actually not running any tests? And so it's not printing anything. Let's see. Okay. 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 Cool. Yeah, this is working. False. True. False. Yes. I think that's what we expect because the second test was about a double bling. So we got that part right. And the other thing I wanted to do was, okay, so we don't need to print anything. Let me just remove all the print statements. Okay, let me go to the end of the line, remove the parentheses. Okay, so, right, so then what do we do? Do we append elements to the list or what? Let's see if this is even a thing. What we want to do is we want to initialize an empty list. Okay, this is how you do it. Okay, and then if, again, don't mind the style too much then we do lst dot what append it's not even append is actually well let's see at least prepend oh just prepend oh i love it it's this simple this feels great so this and then this yeah but this is the time when we should really look for a way to iterate over our enum right so let's see if we're passing at least one test or if we're just failing Okay, fail the compilation. Mm, not found, whatever, some, some cache related stuff. And then, and let's, okay, maybe I need to go var, okay? And I don't need the info anymore, so let's get a bit of a nicer output. Unresolved ref to prepend. Why is that? because it's actually add and what i was looking at was an implementation of a prepend function depending on add okay what about this unresolved reference to add oh 
okay going back to the browser Um, oh no this is not what we want we want just something maybe push is push maybe the right thing or is there something better a plus maybe a plus Or maybe I initialize it as a linked list and then I can just push elements, yeah? Let's try that. So we do linked list, which we probably have to and then we push. We might have to import linked lists. Yeah, uh, where are linked lists located? Quickly going back uh, to the browser. Let me take you with, in, with me. So, Kotlin link list. I want the official doc. Can I have that? No, okay, fine. Mm, I cannot have it because it's part of the Java util. Okay, fine. Well, nice. We should now be able to test. This is nice. Yeah, we're now running the tests, and one of them is failing, and the other one is passing, right? Okay, the final piece of the puzzle, I think, is related to enums again, and it's about how we enumerate or iterate over the enums yeah and we can just do dot values which I absolutely love and we're, we'll actually do for each just do a you know very simple side effecting function and be happy with that because it's quite late so the idea here would be to do something like signal not for each. I think you're gonna like this. I'm gonna do it. initialize the linked list as empty. Then for each signal in signal, if the number and the specific signal signal we have, I have to go back to. Oh, oh, we can use it for the first time. Okay, if which is basically the current element if if number and it equals it dot int then we append or better we push the element we push it yeah and we do that for every single element of signal and then the last, then we'll have to check whether we need to reverse the set. Let's see. Compilation failed. Unresolved wrap to for each. Uh, do I need to do values? Values. Values. For each. Yes. As you can see, we're passing some tests. What I'm expecting now is I'm going to enable all the test and we're going to start failing, failing the ones that require a reverse, a reverse list. Yeah. Because uh, that's the one signal that we didn't encode in the enum class. Uh, because it doesn't really add to the list of signals, it just reverse, reverses the, the list. Uh, the order of the elements in the list, right? And so if I try and run this again, we have some failures, yeah? And so what we can do is we can do, we can check in the same way, right? We can do if we get, uh, 
and again. We can define it here and say val reverse list is this and then if number and reverse list equals reverse list then we need to do list dot reverse I don't know if we can do that in place with a an exclamation mark we cannot or maybe we can no we cannot okay and I don't know if reverse is side affecting or not it shouldn't be let's see it is not yeah so what we can do is we can do lst equals let's see if uh, we cannot right or can we type mismatch okay maybe we can do this right return we can do this this is much much nicer yeah if as this yeah uh, almost there type is match Ooh, okay, so, okay, LST reverse is side affecting and doesn't return anything. Yeah, so this should work. Uh, kind of, still not passing. Uh, this is interesting though, because we had a moment where we were passing um, the test when we had more than one action and now we don't because they get reversed and, um, so i wonder if we just yeah there's something very wrong there so has it always been working i've been wasting a few hours on this for nothing probably what about reverse Okay, this also works. So why? So we're, I thought the spec was about reverse to the order of the operations in the secret handshake. Oh, but it's possible that, so three, for example, was wink and double blink. All oh, right, I think I've been pushing them So I've been, I've been adding them to the very beginning of the list rather than the end. I feel like crying. Uh, and so this now does the opposite of what it was supposed to do. But I have something for you, which is a final version of this. Final, so to speak. So rather than then adding, we would append stuff and then let's see it doesn't know what append is but we can add how do we add to the end just we need to do lst dot size minus one or something just size will it explode no it just passes stuff okay yeah i think this was just a lot like a big misunderstanding I can probably just remove this as well and just do a list of signal and this time and ah oh, this is not okay let's say this okay so hard to recover from this I think really really painful 
and it was all my fault basically because again misinterpreted the, um, the assignment of it and I was expecting to have to have um, yeah I actually meant to have the last the, the larger signal appearing last in the in the list whereas actually because since I was prepending them to the list I had them at the very beginning so reversing the order of the element was actually provide producing the opposite result than, than what I wanted LSD reversed all always did the right thing and I couldn't see it and I guess I was confused by the by the various tests so now this should just pass um, and there's yeah not not much to say I'll have to do heavy heavy editing on this video to make it not a complete waste of time but okay at least we uh, wrapped up the wrapped up the at least we we finished the Kotlin exercises and what we can do here is we can submit Uh, and then go to the exorcism page refresh now mark this as complete and we have our six exercises which means if I go back to the dashboard we now have Kotlin completed which means we're always miss oh we're only this means we're only missing two languages I've opened a poll on Twitter. Doesn't seem to be going very strong at the moment. Um, uh, but I really need your help to figure out what I'm going to be um, doing next. So please chime in. Otherwise, I might be stuck with a random one of these um, in the in the next couple of days. Uh, but thanks for watching and being so patient so far. I'll try and do a bit of uh, editing and make this useful. Uh, and I'll see you super soon. Thanks.